Welcome to The Exchange. I'm Dan Riley. The Exchange is a streaming internet talk show and podcast of interviews with noteworthy people about their lives, ideas, and current events. This week, I sit down with Sean Conley, a research analyst at GiveWell. During our conversation, Sean talks about the history of GiveWell, its methods used in analyzing the cost-effectiveness of charitable organizations, and its primary goals for the future. All right, Sean. Well, first of all, I wanted to uh, just say thank you for taking some time uh, and welcome to the show. It's good to have you on. Yeah, thanks so much. Really excited to talk. Yeah, same here. Uh, would love to start, as I usually do, by just sort of learning uh, a little bit more about you and, and where you grew up. Um, are, are you from the States? And if so, you know, where where did uh, where'd you grow up in, in the U.S.? Uh, I am. I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Okay. Um, and it was, you know, we're, we're in the, the headquarters of, of Give Well. Um, was philanthropy and giving sort of uh, a part of your, your upbringing, or was that something that you sort of established later in your life? Yeah, I think it was something that was sort of on my mind uh, growing up, and especially in high school. I went to a Jesuit high school in Milwaukee, which had a real focus on service and uh, philanthropy, and so we did a lot of volunteering. Uh, at one point in high school, I went to Ecuador on a service trip, and mm-hmm. it's, uh, I think, a little stereotypical that I had this sort of uh, service trip experience and it, and it affected my worldview or something. But um, I think that combined with all the other stuff uh, from my upbringing what made me want to do something with uh, philanthropy or with, with the developing world. Hmm. Um, so that, that all played a part, I think. Hmm. Was, the, was what you saw in Ecuador uh, primarily uh, poverty or like medical difficulties there? What exactly did you see? Uh, it was a lot of poverty. I was somewhere um, at the, it was called the Working Boys Center, which is a uh, program founded by a uh, American priest, and they would uh, take children from the streets and give them education and also practical job training. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like auto mechanic skills and and like baking, bakery stuff like that you could uh, do as a profession. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought I think part of what was so compelling to me was that it seemed like such an interesting. Uh, model of like how to make long-term progress right. in the society and you know some of these people are really poor and, and we would go and see some of their, some of their houses and it's, it's the most poverty I'd ever seen from my suburban background in, right. in Milwaukee um, and so I think and I think what I you know would inspired me so much about that was like creative and effective solution thinking about creative and effective solutions yeah. um, to these sort of problems yeah and and did you take that uh, kind of goal into your, your postgraduate uh, years I mean did you consider that when you were looking into colleges and uh, you know, sort of make that a, a point of, of emphasis when you were looking into sort of post high school years? Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do out of, out of high school. I think I had a lot of interests. Um, but the thing I, I think that in, inspired me, I ended up doing um, a, a degree at Oxford university mm-hmm. called philosophy, politics and economics. Yeah. Uh, and so that seemed like a combination of things about like how does the world work and and how can you improve things uh, in a way that I uh, I think I wrote about this like service trip experience in my college application essay yeah. um, which, which again is a pretty stereotypical thing to do but um, I think it was like influential to me and then uh, that so that experience kind of kind of grew through college and I did uh, economics to developing countries uh, mm-hmm. as, as, a, as a class which I really liked and um, in, in philosophy read Peter Singer who's yeah. a a uh, philosopher who writes about how we have obligations to people in, in other countries and we should be uh, doing as much as we can to help people as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and he also writes about uh, give well, and, and so that's how I ended up here mm. today, I think, is, is, is partly the, that combination of interests and also hearing about it from, from there. Was that your first uh, awareness or, or was that the first time you learned about GiveWell from reading his material? Yeah, I think it was as far as I can remember. Okay. And GiveWell itself, I would love to learn a little bit about the Genesis story of, of how yeah. it came together and kind of what its its founding creed is for its goals in the world. Yeah. So the, the sort of origin story is that our two co-founders are working together in finance and they and a group of friends had extra income that they wanted to give away, and they didn't have any particular cause they were tied to or uh, you know specific desires, uh, but they wanted to just 
do as much good as they possibly could with the money that they're giving away. And so uh, in their spare time, this, this group of them started doing research about charities to try to find out which charities are the most effective. Mm-hmm. And uh, they had trouble finding really good information about which programs are actually working online. And so they started calling a lot of charities uh, and, and faced a lot of barriers there at really finding out what uh, what would help them do the most good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so they realized that this was not like research. This, this research they were looking for didn't really exist. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they decided to start a full-time organization mm-hmm. uh, with some financial support from the coworkers to, uh, with like the initial funding to do this research. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's meant that the original value, uh, or I should say an original value, uh, is like being really transparent with all the research we do so that we can be that resource that they were looking for yeah. for other people who are interested in it. And so we try to share all of our research and, and all the details online. The barriers that they were running into at that time, I'm, I'm wondering about the difference between the world that you guys are trying to create and the world that existed before GiveWell was mm-hmm. around. Um, was was it just that the amount of money that was going just generally towards overhead was so much higher than you'd like it to be or just organizations that were, you know, uh, altruistic in their mission statement were not particularly forthcoming with how they were spending their money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's um, one of the big problems was was it, it was hard to tell uh, mm-hmm. like how people were spending their money. Mm-hmm. Uh, another problem was that it was it was possible to find out about the uh, how much overhead different organizations had, but not that much more information mm-hmm. beyond that. Um, and so something we really believe is that the overhead number isn't sufficient to really find out how good a program is. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you think a program, if you think of a program that say uh, like builds wells or, or something, mm-hmm. there's a lot of questions you should have about whether it's actually helping people do the wells last or do they break down after a couple of years? Is, is the water actually clean? Do people mm-hmm. actually use them? Mm-hmm. Um, and if an organization is only spare, spending one percent of their money on overhead and ninety nine percent on programs, but the water isn't clean, right. or they don't make sure the wells work. Right. Um, that doesn't really. That's pretty clearly not you know making much of a difference. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, much of the research that existed at the time was just, oh, this is the percentage of overhead, mm. uh, but that didn't really seem to go far enough in terms of what's the like biggest impact thing that you can yeah. find. It seems like that investigating those sorts of issues and, and getting deep into those sorts of, of organizations must be exhaustive um, and labor intensive and time intensive. How did, how did GiveWell, or maybe the better question is how does GiveWell sort of decide how they're going to spend their, their time uh, to try to drill down and really get accurate information regarding those issues? Mm-hmm. Well, we started uh, by, by looking in, in the very early days at like a, a big variety of things. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so they looked through like hundreds of charities' tax forms mm-hmm. and looked through uh, hundreds of charities' websites to try to find whether they had good information on their websites mm-hmm. that demonstrated that they were having a having a big impact. Um, and it turns out that most charities don't have this information. It's, yeah. it's pretty tough to find uh, good monitoring data about that demonstrates that you know things are really working and things are really improving people's lives. Um, so the the model we've switched to is looking at independent evidence to mm. find which programs are effective mm. before looking at the charities that are doing them. Right. So development economists and uh, uh, other academics and, and different groups do these big studies about different programs. So you know if you give people clean water, does it does it actually improve their health? Or if you give people uh, bed nets to prevent malaria, does that actually actually prevent malaria? Mm-hmm. Um, so once we figure out, we use the independent evidence to try to figure out which programs work, mm-hmm. and, and then once we've identified those, then we start to look at the charities. Mm. And the independent evidence that, that you've, uh, that the organization generally has been able to uncover, um, I know on your website, as I understand it, there are sort of three primary uh, groups in the world that you recommend giving to in terms of bang for your buck, allocating mm-hmm. money, this is really going to help people and improve yeah. the quality of life for those those th- those uh, for for people in the world. Um, I- I'm wondering if you may know how those three were discovered and what's unique about what they do that makes them uh, worthy of your recommendation. Yeah, um, yeah. So there's. Uh, so I guess you're curious, like what's the what's distinctive about them? And, yeah. And so what's what's so good? So uh, let me talk about each of them. So there's I guess there's actually uh, four, and okay. uh, uh, two of them do it, do the same program. So uh, the first one is the Against Malaria Foundation, mm-hmm. and so they give away these bed nets that I mentioned, uh, which are uh, people hang them in above their beds, and they block and kill mosquitoes, mm-hmm. and uh, mosquitoes transmit malaria, which is still one of the leading killers of children in the mm-hmm. world. And and so what's great about them is both that the um, 
bed nets have been really well studied. There's over 20 high quality randomized studies that, mm. that consistently show that uh, bed nets do a really good job at, at uh, preventing malaria. Um, and it's a cheap program and highly effective, so you get good bang for your buck. And the Against Malaria Foundation does this uh, great job at being really transparent mm. and sharing all its information and also collecting better information than almost any other charity we're aware of in the world about mm. its program. So they go every six months uh, after they give out the nets and they check that people are still using them and then they post the information, that what they've discovered about mm-hmm. how many people are still using them um, on their website. Cool. Um, the, the next two are uh, the Schistosomiasis Control Initiative and the uh, Deworm the World, uh, which are both charities that do deworming programs. So um, a, a running pattern here is, is that none of these programs are really very sexy or, or the type of thing you hear about with charity, but um, there they're, they're are great great opportunities to do good. So these, these two programs uh, give out deworming pills. So children around the world uh, in, in Africa and Asia have uh, parasitic infections which are very cheap to treat. It costs around 50 cents per child per year to, to treat these infections with, mm-hmm. with these deworming pills. And uh, there's some evidence that the long-term effects of having these worms in your child can impact your, your future development and, in particular, your earnings. There's a, um, the evidence isn't as strong as for the bed nets about the size of the effects or, or the strength of the effects, but um, there's one very high-quality, well-known study that found that children who were dewormed as children had 25% higher incomes as adults mm-hmm. than the other children who you know, randomly were chosen not to be dewormed. Right. Um, so this seems like potentially really high impact. Uh, Is that because of the illness that the parasite how it impacts them throughout their life or just the, uh, they're just bedridden and, and sick their, their entire life. So they're not able to work. It's a, uh, it's a little unclear exactly what the effect okay. is. It seems like they, because the, the pills don't have a ton of, or sorry, the, the worms don't have a ton of, uh, obvious symptoms of okay. um, some of them and, and they're not, uh, um, you know, deadly to have, but okay. it seems like they are, um, Subtly affecting your development yeah. and uh, their malady. Their their malady exactly. Yeah. Um, in this in this original study, of the uh, in the original study, which paid attention to their days of schooling, the mm-hmm. children got an extra school. Uh, sorry, the children who got dewormed had more were able to attend more days of schooling that year. Okay, um, presumably because they were a little bit healthier mm-hmm. thanks to the deworming pills. Mm-hmm. Um, and so a, a question is maybe the additional days of schooling helped them have the higher income later in life right. um, or maybe the the school is connected to some health benefits that they were you know a little bit stronger a little right. bit a little bit smarter a little bit, a little bit better developed as adults okay um, and so the the final charity we recommend is called give directly right and they do cash transfers so they go to some of the poorest people in the world in, in rural Africa and give away uh, they just give them cash and uh, because it's such a straightforward program, they're able to give away, you know, like 90 cents on the dollar that, that gets donated to them. And they've also been subjected to rigorous study, and in particular, the uh, actual program that Give Directly themselves runs has mm-hmm. been evaluated by uh, academics in a randomized controlled trial. Okay. And so, um, you know, you might fear that people would spend money they're given on, on drugs or alcohol or otherwise waste it, right. and it seems like for the most part people are, they're, the amount People are increasing spending on, on stuff like that um, barely changes. Um, people seem to spend the money on long-term investments or, or on food mm-hmm. or on improving their health. And so the uh, thing that seems really great about this is the idea is that you, rather than uh, the donors picking what they think people might most need, is that you just give the people who know best right. the power to buy the things that will, will most benefit them. Right. And these are people that are impoverished, I'm assuming. Right, exactly. So these are in uh, generally in rural Africa yep. um, and in some of the poorest places in the world. Okay. How did GiveWell find these four particular organizations? Did, did, was it just serendipitous where the co-founders or people who work, worked here um, learned about them and did some due diligence and, and they bubbled up to the top? Or how, how exactly were they discovered? Mm-hmm. Um, it's like largely a result of um, you know researching a space for many years mm-hmm. and, and sort of uh, – Growing our uh, uh, can't even remember the word level of awareness so that people are like know to, to come to us. So the, the the process that we use to find charities that we're we're you know currently evaluating in an ongoing way is a combination mm-hmm. of um, reaching out to charities that we think are doing that we think might be promising and okay. charities coming to us and saying hey, hey could you evaluate us? Um, so so in these cases I don't know the specifics or the like very origin of each of them with our relationship to us, but but generally it's each of them are doing programs that we find to be 
uh, highly effective and highly cost effective. So, so right. great bang for your buck based on this independent evidence. Yeah. Um, and so because we think the evidence for them is so strong, then when we're, we're talking to charities, we're really interested in okay. uh, evaluating them deeply. And, and these four have sort of won out. I'm, I'm wondering how many other organizations, albeit some of them may not be quite as uh, impactful or effective, but are you know, probably their heart is in the right place. Mm-hmm. Um, how many how many different organizations have been vetted and, and investigated to get to the four? Was it 100 that you guys looked at in these four one, or what, what sort of the, the numbers look like there? Yeah, so uh, uh, like I said, you know, originally we sort of looked at hundreds of websites. Okay. Um, and, and you're totally right that the, I think you said earlier that, you know, the research is like highly intensive and, and, yeah. and takes a lot of capacity. So the I think maybe 100 or 150 we've had the, like, had exchanges with or, okay. or they've, they've started in our process. Um, but because we're, we're really interested in finding the, the best opportunities that we can mm-hmm. rather than trying to rate as many charities as possible, yep. um, we try to allocate our resources so that we maximize the chance of, you know, finding additional top charities. And yep. so we try to uh, have sort of a funnel process where we're dropping out, uh, halting research on organizations as soon as we can tell that uh, it's not looking promising that they would, they would be a top charity. Yeah. And and so these four are, are sort of at the top now. Are you are you guys consistently looking for additional uh, organizations to recommend, or do you feel pretty confident that these four are going to be the main ones you'll be recommended for for years to come? We're uh, we're definitely still still looking and doing a lot to find more organizations. Um, a big a big driver of this is that we, as the amount of money and the amount of donations that we've influenced has grown, mm-hmm. uh, the organizations we recommend can only take in so much money. So something we right. You know, are concerned about is giving an organization too much money in one year compared to what it had before, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, just because an organization can do well with uh, one five million dollars, it doesn't mean it could do well with twenty or fifty million dollars. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so, there, there's a limit to how much you can give to any any specific organization. So, um, we're you know interested in, in continuing to expand. So, uh, we're doing a doing a few things to it. I can talk talk through some of those if that's sure. Cool. Um, so the you know the the major thing we're continuing to do is, is research about different different charities and uh, a, there are a couple of things that sort of change over the years. So one is we have more staff capacity now than we did in the past, and so we're a lot where you can uh, look at many more types of things and, and many more charities. Um, we're also moving a lot more money than we were in the past, and so a. Uh, reason that charities might sometimes hesitate to go through our process, which which is very intensive both for us but also for them, it takes a lot of their staff time, right. um, is that I think the in- incentives have shifted somewhat for the charities now that the size of money they could conceivably get, get from our process um, has changed. And so we're trying hard this year to uh, dig into a lot of charities that we would like to review mm-hmm. but um, need their uh, you know, per- permission and, and need them to go along with it because we need uh, them to share a lot of information with us. Um, the, and the other thing we're doing is continuing to look at different programs. So there's a lot of uh, programs where the evidence is less clear or, you know, we haven't looked at in, in some time. And so mm-hmm. it's possible that there are different types of programs that we could imagine um, recommending. So uh, maybe surgeries or uh, micronutrient or, mm-hmm. or like nutrition programs um, that, that we think are promising. And, and we're also trying to do work to create new charities for the future. Mm-hmm. So experience we've had is we've, we've sometimes we've struggled over the uh, past few years to find charities that are doing programs that we think have really strong evidence and, mm-hmm. and are also really cost effective. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, there, you know, there's a limited number of programs that have really strong evidence. There's a limited number of charities working on those programs. So we're trying to fund... Uh, there's a couple different types of program we've identified that have a little bit of research and seem really promising. And so we're working with uh, Good Ventures, a foundation we have a close partnership with, to fund more research on those programs mm-hmm. to see, you know, do they actually work? Is, is this first study just a fluke? Do they work in different places and at different times? Um, and we're also giving uh, seed grants to small organizations that seem like they have the potential to one day be top charities. And if we give them a little money now, they can develop a track record to demonstrate that they're, you know, highly impactful organizations down the line. Yeah. I know before the interview, I think you were mentioning that you, you guys recently have gone from something like 13 employees to up to 30 or 35 employees. It, what does the process look like by which you decide it's time to hire 
uh, more people on staff? Is it just the amount of uh, revenue you guys are able to bring in plus the desire to do more research? Or uh, what, where, where is the most of the people that have, that have come in the company within the past year, two years, uh, what kind of work primarily are they involved in? Is it, is it research or is it something else? It's, it's been a mix. So um, I joined two and a half years ago, and okay. I, was, I think I was the seventh. And then that summer we had another few joins. So it, was, it was 12 or 13, I think, by the end of the summer of 20. 13, I guess. Okay. Um, and so, uh, you know, at that point, we'd been around since 2007 and, and hadn't grown much. It had had hovered sort of between like three and seven employees, basically, for right. the entire existence. Um, and and it's the, and, yeah, like you said, since then, since then we've grown to 32. So the, or, or so, um, I can't remember the exact number at, at the moment. Uh, it's, things are changing too fast around <laughs> here. Um, but the... Uh, the, the the speed of growth is, is sort of a, a combination of a few things. So so one is the um, you know money moved as as we're moving more money, it seems appropriate to be growing the staff and then the capacity. Um, the thing that really slowed our growth for a long time was management capacity. Hmm. So we were uh, interested in growing at a really careful rate so that we didn't exceed the ability of like managers on staff and, and the co-founders in particular in the beginning to you know carefully review and carefully train staff mm-hmm. to do the work so we could con- continually uh, produce high quality work right. and not sacrifice the quality as we were producing more quantity right. um, and so over the last you know year or two we've started to feel that we have like more management capacity and, and more people have taken on responsibilities that the co-founders previously had to do and are you know trained up to do them at a very high quality mm-hmm. and so we're uh over 2000 uh at the end of 2014 and, and 2015 we felt like we could hire a lot more people and, and and grow a lot and especially because we had so much more influence than we'd had in previous years right. i think last year we moved um in 2015 we influenced uh, a little over a hundred million dollars in donations and so um, we're you know trying to uh, have the research at a level that's appropriate for for the amount of money we're influencing yeah and knowing that you you're having more of an impact and you said that the number of, of roughly like a hundred million how do you know that that's the amount of money that you're influencing is that the amount of money that people through your website then link on to uh, the recommended charities and, and donate, or, or what, how, how do you sort of track what the success mm-hmm. is looking like from your perspective? Yeah, so this is something we try to track pretty carefully because it's the main indication to us of, of what impact we're having, which right. is something you know we, we care about <laughs> given that we, we try to measure that at other organizations. Um, and so the it's it's a couple of things. So we allow people to donate to us through our website, mm-hmm. uh, or, or sorry, donate to the charities we recommend through our website, and we don't take any fees from that. Like they're you know credit card processing fees or whatever, but we don't take any uh, fees ourselves. We right. just pass the money on to the charities that people prefer. Uh, and the reason we, we do that is to, is to attract this money. So a lot of the money comes through the website. And we also ask the uh, donors who, you know, they're, we're totally happy for people to give to the charities directly. We have a survey form on our website that people can fill out to say, hey, just wanted to let you know I gave, you know, $10,000 to the Against Money Foundation and wanted to make sure you, it was due to your research, so I want to make sure you count it. Uh, and we also are very careful to not make sure we're not double counting right. with the um, charity because they also will tell us they have they all have drop down menus on their website that say right. how'd you hear about us. And right. so if, uh, if people respond give well uh, or an article that was like if they say I heard about it from the Nick Kristoff article in the New York Times, which was written because of us, and then we track stuff like that too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, then we you try to try to be pretty careful at not yeah. double counting people who would have come through, uh, people who are we are hearing about from multiple places. Was, and and the the money that directly funds you know putting you know, getting the lights on in here and, and paying for the salaries of the staff. Is that primarily received through direct donation from from donors? Do you solicit that from grants from uh, organizations throughout the country? How do you how do you pay your own bills? How does the company mm-hmm. pay its own, own bills to exist? Yeah, yeah. So so we are a nonprofit, and so we're you know supported by donors. Um, it's largely from individual donors or people who have used our research for a long time and, and think that we're a good opportunity to give to because we are leveraging the impact of so many mm-hmm. other people's donations. Um, there's a couple. There's also a couple foundations that, that give us some money, and then the, we get a, a large chunk from Good Ventures, which the foundation we work closely with, also supports our operating costs. Yeah, and I would imagine in the noise of the internet, right? I mean, the, the, it's a it's a battle for attention of trying to get people to know about your research and, and what you do. 
what's the strategy been? You mentioned the, the Nick Kristoff article in the New York Times. Uh, how does GiveWell try to broadcast its message and its research out into the public to get more attention so that ideally, right, uh, more people are positively impacted by money that's allocated towards philanthropy generally? How do you, how do you try to market yourself to the, to the world? Yeah, it's actually not something we've done a lot of historically. Oh. Um, in the in the early days, the two co-founders tried uh, a little bit of a, a variety of different things and, and didn't get a ton of positive response. Mm-hmm. And uh, and the response they, they sometimes got was, you know, hey, we want to see like higher quality research. We, we we think you guys don't have like the full full answer yet. So mm-hmm. um, for for a number of years up until very recently, we took the attitude of let's have the best research we can, put all of our staff capacity, which, which like we were saying, was, was pretty limited for a mm-hmm. while, um, all the staff capacity we can into research to make this product as good as possible. Uh, and, and fortunately, that worked reasonably well. Our, you know, our money moved, grew every year. And I think that was a combination of um, you know, the research being good and uh, so people coming to us, people being able to find us um, online or mm-hmm. hearing about us from friends. And then we would do a little bit of... Um, media or other attention when when opportunities presented themselves right. um so you know we, we talked to new york times reporters when, when they would reach out um and and like do a talk here and there but but for the most part it's kept it pretty limited and in the last few months we've we've now realized we got to a point where we, we think our research product is really high quality mm-hmm. it's worth people knowing about um we also now have increased staff capacity to do different things and right. so Going forward, we're going to try to be doing a little bit more on the outreach side, and mm-hmm. um, I think exactly what we do remains to be seen. I, I think yeah. it'll probably still be pretty content-driven, so you know, still try to be producing a lot of quality content that, that's engaging to people. And uh, but then the then the question we're thinking about right now is: Should we be doing uh, search engine optimization stuff? Should right. we be doing more talks? Should we sit down and talk to all of our donors individually? Right. Um, what what types of things should we be doing more of? Yeah. In the ideal candidates that you have looked for in the past year, two years, and that you will be looking for in the next year or two years, are they generally PhD researchers? Are they just bright people that you come across that have a passion for the organization? What What are some of the characteristics of people that you're looking for to, to hire here? It's a uh, it's a variety, and there's no real set uh, needs that we've had. We're you know generally looking for smart, talented people mm-hmm. and who are motivated by the, the stuff we're working on. I think mm-hmm. a, a common thing that connects people who are here is that they're really excited about the type of work we do. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we've hired a number of people over the last two years straight out of college and uh, or we'd have you know we have interns every summer from mm-hmm. uh, going to their senior year in college. Mm-hmm. Um, but we've also uh, in the last few months hired a few people who are uh, a few years or more out of college coming from a, a variety of jobs um, who have a little bit more experience mm-hmm. and um, you know maybe can come in and, and hit the ground running um, and so going forward we're like slowing recruiting down a little bit at mm-hmm. the moment having just added a bunch of people this year we now want to uh, use that capacity to do research rather than use that capacity to keep adding more capacity um, but it's uh, you know we're always like excited to have people join who are really excited about what we do and, mm-hmm. and who can make a big difference and so we're like always excited for people who uh, like this type of thing and, and think they could contribute and be a good fit to reach out. And is the organization solely in San Francisco right now or are you across the, the country or the world too? Yeah, so we're um, the base in San Francisco and our only real, our only actual office is in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. We have one uh, remote employee in Seattle now and then we have a few people uh, as part of the Open Philanthropy Project, which I can describe who are based in D.C. Sure. Uh, so the Open Philanthropy Project is our new project uh, in the last couple of years in, in partnership with this foundation, Good Ventures. Mm-hmm. And so Good Ventures was founded by uh, Facebook co-founder Dustin Moskowitz mm-hmm. and, and his wife, Carrie Tuna. Mm-hmm. Um, and they are interested in, in a similar thing that we are. So they're interested in you know giving a large amount of money away and doing it as effectively and impactfully as possible. And so we joined up with them a couple of years ago to uh, help try to f- help them try to figure out what is the best way they can do that. Mm-hmm. And so the, the question is a little different than traditional give well because when you're at that scale, the large donor foundational scale, uh, you can do things that you might not as an individual donor. So, for example, you could start a whole new organization, which right. which can be tough to do if you're you're a small individual donor. Um, and so the uh, questions we've been investigating there are, are a little bit broader. It's you know with the opportunity to do anything you, you can think of with money, what are the most effective things you can do? And so uh, we've been doing. 
that for a couple of years, and, and in, in the last year or so, we branded that project as the Open Philanthropy Project. Mm-hmm. Um, and so a couple of the staff who work on who work largely in that are based out of D.C. Hmm. And are the findings or the initial findings that they're uh, working on, are, are they significantly different than the general recommendations of, the, of GiveWell at large or, or not really? Um, it's, it's kind of interesting. I think it's still hard to say, like, what the uh, definite best things will be. And right. so an, an approach we've taken is to have different cause areas that seem like they could be uh, you know, at least competitive, if not better than mm-hmm. our, our top charities, because mm-hmm. we're, you know, uh, interested in, in doing as much as possible, um, uh, or as, as much good as possible, sorry, so that we've, we've picked a few cause areas mm-hmm. and uh, have started to, to make grants in those. Um, and the, the tricky part with the open philanthropy research is a lot of the work we're doing is much harder to measure the impact of over mm-hmm. time mm-hmm. Um, compared to doing something like giving someone a bed net and, and trying to measure its effect on their health. Right. Um, if you're doing, say, policy advocacy, it's hard to say. Does the you know did the people we fund who lobbied the government about this did their work actually affect this change, um, or was it would have would it have changed anyway? Right. Um, similarly, some of the stuff we're thinking about is is long shots. So maybe you do scientific research, and uh, you know most of the projects you fund might fail, and then right. you're hoping for the one that really just has an incredible breakthrough. Right. Uh, and so just because something failed doesn't mean it was a bad bet to take. It's mm-hmm. possible it was, it was just so likely it would fail anyway. Yep. Um, so I think it's going to be hard to know exactly which. Uh, things in the end were the were the best bets to take because of some of these problems. Yeah. Um, but we're trying to figure out like which ones are, uh, you know, at least competitive. And, yeah. And trying to figure that out. And is the the decision to be based in San Francisco is that largely because of your relationship with Good Ventures, or is it just that the co-founders decided that this was the place they wanted to set up shop? Yeah. So we were originally in New York actually okay. um, until the beginning of 2013. Uh, and it was a combination of the relationship with Good Ventures made it make sense to be out here, mm-hmm. and also the, I think, Bay Area environment is, is a good place for us to be between the, um, there's a lot of um, wealth and also a lot of people who I think, you know, think similarly to us about, uh, like, sort of or this uh, rational, you might say, a, a mm-hmm. approach to charity, although that's kind of a loaded word, um, of, like, how can I do the most good as possible? How can yeah. I try to, like, optimize the, the dollars I'm giving? Um, I think that, that goes in line with a lot of the, the people who are out here. I'm wondering if because of your the impact of the way that GiveWell is is applying their research to, towards charities and, and philanthropy in the world, if they if you're noticing that other uh, organizations that are involved in charitable works are beginning to change themselves, sort of self self correct in some ways of maximizing in a bigger way their the way they're allocating their resources. Is that something that you hear stories about or learn about through them directly or through other people? It's it's something we're we're hoping for. I think yeah. it's hard to say whether the whether there's been like a big shift in, in the sector. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there's probably been a growth in the interest of donors in in impactful charities and uh, charities that you know do a good job of, of measuring and, and effectively using marginal dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you know you would expect that to hopefully feed through to the charities themselves. Um, being encouraged by by the donors to them, mm-hmm. um, and some of the, um, yeah, and I think some of the you know there's some extent to which like new technology allows some of this stuff to be tracked better. So, uh, Give Directly, for example, is only a few years old, and they use uh, mobile money transfer systems. So they have a, a great mobile banking system in mm-hmm. Kenya where they can you can send money and, and Give Directly does send money directly to people's cell phones and. Uh, this, so the program would have been much harder to do if you just had to hand out cash or, or checks or something. It'd be much harder to monitor and right. and prevent fraud with. But um, I think this new technology is, is uh, allowing the, the program to be like really highly impactful and, and well monitored. Yeah, I, I know you were you were mentioning earlier in the conversation about how you know your uh, your mission trip when you were at your Jesuit high school going down to, to South America had such an, a strong impact on you and sort of changed the trajectory of your life in some way. I'm wondering if living in San Francisco with so much wealth and so many people becoming wealthy and so many people seemingly, there definitely is poverty here to some degree and homelessness here to maybe a larger degree. Um, If it gets difficult for you or for your coworkers to remind yourselves of why you're doing this when you're not directly necessarily surrounded by the people you're impacting or if there's something that you do or that the the people you work with do to try to keep that spirit alive and keep that re- the reality of how other people live um, kind of in your consciousness yeah yeah i definitely i definitely think it can be um and there's a 
you know, on the uh, on the one hand, living in San Francisco has its, has its perks, and, and my life is comfortable, and I don't have to worry about like my internet at home dying mm-hmm. rap- quickly or running out of hot water or something. You know, like I might um, if I was living in a developing country and, and trying to do direct work there. Um, but at, at the same time, I'm not you know seeing the, the people I'm helping and, and having that that motivational mm-hmm. aspect. Mm-hmm. Um, and we do we do site visits occasionally, although um, not very frequently um, to, to some of the places that we, to the, the charities that we recommend, we do site visits to all of them before we recommend them. So mm-hmm. um, I did go to Burkina Faso in Africa last year uh, cool. to investigate one of the charities that's currently one of our standout charities, uh, Development Media International. Um, and so you know, that was an informative experience. But no, I think it is um, something that uh, both for us and I think the, the donors that, that use our research is sort of different than a lot of other um, organization. So, you know, we don't give a lot of um, picture. We don't have pictures on our website of, mm-hmm. of the people that you might be helping, and uh, we don't do a lot of like stories or narratives. And so, I think it's an uh, interesting study and something I'm not very confident in the answer of. Of like, right. you know, to what extent would I be motivated differently if if I knew uh, more about the the individuals or or, or more about the, the backgrounds and. Uh, similar, you know, uh, would our would our donors respond differently if, if they were more like mm-hmm. aware? Um, but I think at the same time, it, it shows somewhat that the um, like what seems like kind of an, an abstract level of people of just knowing about the suffering, uh, mm-hmm. not knowing about the suffering directly, but you know, knowing that you are doing something to alleviate suffering and, and doing something to improve the world um, seems to be. You, uh, more motivating than I think than maybe people might have expected uh, mm-hmm. before the existence of GiveWell and um, especially for you know so many of our donors who uh, give based on like the this evidence and the and the research rather than any like um, specific specific narratives which I think might be surprising to some some people mm-hmm. and, and for people that want to look into that research and they you know, potentially are considering becoming a donor. Um, to one of the, the charities that, that you recommend, what, what would you recommend that they do to make a decision about where they want to uh, make that contribution? Would it, would it be reading research papers that you've uh, that the organization has published? Is it just visiting your website? What, what would you recommend that they do to, to make that decision? Yeah, well, on the, uh, the the good news is that the research that we do is all on our website and mm-hmm. is heavily footnoted, and so it's. Uh, in theory, possible to go through the research and, and trace back all of our reasoning, and, and you could read through. Uh, the bad news is it's really dense, and there's, there's a <laughs> ton of it there, and so it's uh, uh, it's not exactly easy to read all of our all of our research. And, and so this is actually one of the things we're we're trying to think about: is you know, should we have a couple of pages on our website that are like give well one hundred and one right. and walking you through better, or like uh, better summaries of, of, of what our charities do. But, um, yeah, I think our, I think our website is a awesome resource for, for figuring this out, um, because of how much content is there. Um, and there are some, um, there are some pages that hopefully make it a little clearer that the difference is and and all of our research reports, even though they have 200 footnotes do have (laughs) like summaries at the top for people to read. Um, and so I think that, you know, the, uh, like I said, the, the four charities we recommend all have, um, different, like, Benefits. So, if you're really interested in, um, you know, giving people all the autonomy to, to do what they prefer to do or to solve the problems themselves, mm-hmm. then cash transfers are a good bet. If, if you're really interested in uh, this potential for a huge impact from a cheap program, then deworming is a good bet. And mm-hmm. if you're interested in something that's really well studied and is going to you know, save children's lives uh, with the with the bed nets, then the Against Malaria Foundation is, is a good bet. And mm-hmm. um, some more of the, the details and the uh, also, the risks and reservations that we have about the charities are, are on our website in those reports. Cool. Last question I want to ask you. Um, how do you see the future for, for the organization and maybe even for, for charitable giving in general? I mean, if you project out, right, you've had this this massive growth in the past few years of employees at the, the organization. Um, five, ten years down the road, uh, what are your goals? What, what, do you, what do you hope GiveWell will look like in that period of time? Well, it's a, a couple of different things. So there's the both the, the GiveWell aspect and the, the Unplugged and Finance Project aspect. So mm-hmm. I think with um, GiveWell, you know, we hope to continue to expand the, the research we're doing and, uh, you know, continue to find better and better giving opportunities or at mm-hmm. least find more and more things that are, you know, competitive with the things we currently recommend. Um, so I think, you know, five, ten years from now, hopefully we are have a, a big set of or, you know, uh, we have a large room for more funding for charities, whether that's a couple charities that can take in 
an enormous volume of money every year and find <laughs> awesome places to put it or, or a bunch of charities doing a bunch of different programs um, and uh, hope to be, you know, moving money in to uh, these, these charities from donors who are interested in, in having an impact and, mm-hmm. and hope that um, the, we continue to be a, a good resource for them and, and more and more people find us. Um, and with the Open Philanthropy Project, you know, similarly continuing to do research so that we can move, like, uh, big volumes of money from, from good ventures and other large large donors who are interested in that type of research. Because um, one of the things we're trying to do with the Open Finance Project is be a resource for, similar to GiveWell, anyone, any large foundations who are uh, interested in giving at a really large scale. And so, mm-hmm. um, you know, have a number of great cause areas and be finding lots of awesome giving opportunities in those areas and, and filling the needs we see. Cool. Well, Sean, thank you again so much uh, for, for coming on the show. It was a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, thanks to you too. I, I really enjoyed this. Thanks for listening. If you're interested in learning more about The Exchange, want to listen to episodes online, or would like to reach out to the show, feel free to visit the show's website at theexchangeshow.com. Thank you.